yeah, that's fine. Great. Yeah, so good afternoon. All. Thanks for the invitation to come and present you today on uh, automation of infrastructure and uh, inspection and maintenance. So I wanted to start off by making a bit of a case for automation. Uh, and I kind of refer back to some of the key challenges and risks that uh, we're all trying to support and address uh, in this uh, wonderful industry we work in. So we know we're facing pretty kind of significant challenges. Um, for example, the changes to the way that uh, frontline teams now access the infrastructure safe, safely, um, have some implications for the way we carry out our uh, inspection and maintenance activity and the, the amount of work we can do and the type of work we can do, especially working at night, for example. Um, we also know that a number of uh, key maintenance tasks still rely heavily on manual effort on human labour, um, but we know this poses some risks to the short and long term health of our uh, the teams involved and an aging workforce and perhaps some changing expectations about the kind of desirable jobs in future. I think also pose further longer term risks to the sustainability of current working practices. Then, of course, we've got um, the, the ongoing financial sustainability challenge and with the, uh, the kind of investment in our response to COVID, that's also thrown that into an even sharper focus. So we've got some things to think about there. Uh, and also uh, what climate change, but more importantly and more immediately, weather resilience. So how do we protect our infrastructure from the extreme weather events that we're seeing today never mind um, if that frequency of those events increases uh, in future due to longer term effects of of climate change so perhaps automation if done well offers some solutions some outcome outputs for us here so if it's carefully designed um, we should be able to achieve objectives around improving safety of uh, workforce of passengers of public so we could envisage a situation where we're removing our workforce from the risk of harm due to traffic taking track workers out of the way of trains in an even uh, more effective way than we have moved to in recent uh, years we can also i think envisage a future where we're supporting the health of our frontline teams by removing them from particular hazards associated with manual handling, uh, hand arm vibration, uh, exposure to certain uh, sort of chemicals or ballast dust, for example. I think too, we can also achieve our second objective about improving capacity on the railway if we looked at ways of automating certain uh, ways of working, um, because automating certain tasks allows us to introduce more reliable and reproducible methods of inspection repair, for example, and might touch on some of those a bit later as well as increasing the pro productivity of uh, of certain activities. And we could certainly look at the, uh, the financial sustainability of our industry and costs of inspection and maintenance. Uh, so, for example, we've got a we've got projects in the current R&D portfolio, um, one which again I'll touch on later, but automating railhead defect repair, for example, where the benefits cases that have been worked up estimate that over a typical five year funding period we could save as much as 90 million pounds um, or benefit in terms of 90 million pounds likewise automating inspections of tunnels uh, the uh, the analysis suggests we could reduce on track examination time by 96 percent through the careful application of technology uh, and also uh, more broadly we've got a, an obligation uh, because the industry has agreed and set some visions in the UK rail technical strategy, one of those being a reliable and easy to maintain set of assets fixed as well as moving. So uh, we have a significant part to play in delivering that vision. And uh, to be fair, um, the industry needs a bit of help in terms of what that the milestones look like to get to that vision of a, a 2050 railway. So there's a, a good business opportunity, I would contend, but what about the ethical perspective? Is it the right thing to do? I just thought I'd touch on the example first of all, driverless cars, which um, and we know many technical many tech companies are investing heavily in. 
the cars themselves, um, there's a lot of problems I guess to solve and they need to be capable of interacting with the unpredictability of human drivers on the roads, with uh, a changing environment, with obstacles, uh, whether that's animate or inanimate objects, balancing the risk between people inside the vehicle and outside the vehicle. That's the well publicised issue around liability and insurance when things go wrong. So the burden now for, falls to the manufacturer or the AI designer who, you know, to, to be determined, I think, but it certainly um, moves, shifts away from the, uh, the driver. Uh, and there's got to be some really clever integration with the ex existing infrastructure because it's very variable condition. But even if all these complex technological, legal and regulatory issues can be ironed out, um, and there's still quite a large hurdle to overcome in terms of the level of trust, public trust uh, in this particular technology. There's well publicised events um, over the last few years, isn't there, of, of the technology uh, going wrong and killing people. But if this is a step too far, what about other opportunities that maybe are interim steps along the way? In the middle photograph shows an example of one of these currently in operation, and that's sort of an off-highway automated shuttle bus. So you're removing or well, you're separating this particular technology from conventional technology uh, and getting it to, to work well um, between discrete destinations. And on the far right there, there's um, oh, I think is a, an even more fascinating example, uh, potentially more successful example. This is a one of those huge dumper trucks. Um, this is in Australia, the Rio Tinto company. Uh, now operate a fleet of 130 of these trucks um, autonomously. So the the operators have been taken from the mining sites and uh, they now supervise the operation of this kit um, miles and miles away in control centres that look like the, uh, you know, the layout of the Starship Enterprise. Uh, and they've got some real benefits from doing this, not only in terms of the, the safety of their operators, but in terms of lower running costs and actually more availability and capacity in their existing operation. Um, really you know, cutting edge technology but it shows it's it's there it's here it's here today it's not the future um this automation is working in a heavy industry uh, and no doubt will find its way through to other industries too and it only takes a brief look at the the media to see that digital technologies are fast revolutionizing the nature of human labor and you know, it's been labelled the fourth industrial revolution. This this closer melding of uh, of people and technology, um, which tends to it, it inspires some, excites some, but leaves others of us behind, essentially. Uh, but as more companies and more organisations and governments embrace artificial intelligence and robotics, there's kind of one essential question really, which is what's the ethical approach to all this? What kind of obligations do governments and companies and leaders have towards their workforce uh, as the technology develops? How does the world deal with ethical problems uh, associated with automation, such as you know, humans no longer, no longer feeling like they take account uh, for the failures of a process? Uh, De-skilling and uh, you know, changes in the, the requirements from a, a human work, a people-based workforce, and also using AI in unethical ways, perhaps ways that were not designed uh, by the uh, the originators of the technology. And uh, you know, again, if you look on the recent media, um, you won't have to look too hard to find references to Chat GPT, the new uh, search engine capability that Microsoft has been developing to uh, tackle Google's dominance in this field. But already people are using it to do tasks that perhaps it uh, wasn't originally designed for and uh, perhaps border on um, less uh, ethical application of the technology. You know, is it ethical to write your uh, university or school assignment with chat GPT? Uh, is it ethical to use it to create music or art? Um, there's lots to discuss in there. But, and also it highlights you know, Google's recent uh, issue with its own version, BARD, um, where the example that the presentation they were giving to their investors, the uh, the AI came up with the wrong answer. I didn't consider all of the facts in its answer. Um, highlights the the risks associated with 
introducing this technology at a pace which where perhaps it hasn't been carefully considered and tested. But there's much research underway in this field. Uh, for example, at MIT in the US, they've concluded that business leaders and uh, political leaders must better comprehend the adverse effects of the technologies they implement. To commit to creating systems that drive social cohesion and economic growth. Uh, and the MIT team uh, make the case that human workers should and will always remain central and critical to the workplace in the near future, of the near future and of the future. Augmenting, complementing and controlling the strengths of technology, not being defined by it. They kind of identified four stages of automation from cost focused, uh, which is in their definition, the lowest level of technology to performance driven, where the systems and processes are re-engineered to use automation to their advantage while still using human expertise to fill in the technological gaps to more positively um, what they call employee centered automation, which is about the, uh, the technology optimizing performance and enriching and developing workers to socially responsible optimization, which is kind of the top of their pyramid where automation is used is developed to create a vast array of jobs in the uh, economy, driving wider economic success and growth while also endorsing the well-being of society, which is a massive project, um, but one that they contend that our political and business leaders need to step up to the plate on uh, as this technology moves on at a pace. So what about network rail strategy for automation? So in terms of the R&D that's going on, Working closely with academia and our supply chain partners, such as Ukrin and other UK funded research and uh, EU programmes, we've created a cross asset autonomous intelligent systems R&D strategy with these three themes. So smart data collection using state of the art sensors to either fixed to infrastructure or mounted on mobile platforms to collect more and better quality data about our asset providing it more quickly to the engineers who need to make good decisions about where and when to intervene. Um, autonomous planning, so developing tools and techniques to help plan maintenance intervention based on our enhanced asset event, knowledge of the asset and also our ability to, to access and uh, deliver that work. And finally, autonomous robotics, so delivering workforce safety and maintenance productivity benefits, as I touched on previously. But talking about autonomy, how much autonomy are we looking to build into, in our case, network rails development? Um, the one uh, measure we're using is something called the NASA float scale and float stands for function specific level of autonomy and automation tool. And our R&D is focusing on projects in the levels two to five range. So with the operator very much in the loop for carrying out the task. And in more advanced cases, and I'll touch on one or two of those in a bit, um, with systems carrying out some initial elements of analysis and ranking for confirmation by the operator of the technology. So we're trying to set ourselves some um, realistic goals, but also goals I think that align quite well with the MIT uh, pyramid of, of automation uh, and keeping our uh, people really at the heart of the, the role, the delivering their roles in the railway and using technology to enrich those roles, not replace those roles. So how about some examples then just to uh, flesh some of this out? So the first thing I wanted to show you, it's not inspection and maintenance, but um, if I can get this to work, there's a bit of technology that uses machine learning with some manually input rule sets to optimise the sequence of tasks in large complex construction projects uh, and this is uh, a piece of kit that HS2 are using the Align consortium who are building um, part of the route are using this to plan and construct a three kilometer viaduct uh, on part of the first phase section of HS2 so cross my fingers this video will work in fact what I need to do is realized Just a show of sound.
Let's try again. platform. With Alice, large general contractors and owners can plan, bid, and build more effectively. Sounds intriguing, right? Here's how it works. There are four steps to using Alice. The first is plan. Working in Alice is fast and easy. Just upload a 3D model if you have one or a precedence diagram if you don't. Next, define your labor and equipment availability, production rates, crane locations, and calendars, and add any additional constraints you might have. The fun begins when you input your construction methods, which are represented in Alice as recipes. Recipes contain the required tasks, resources, and logic to complete an element of your project. You can reuse recipes or improve on them as you learn between projects. Alice is parametric which means that you can change any project parameter on the fly and reschedule your project instantly. Based on your plan, Alice will simulate your project millions of times, automatically creating solutions that satisfy your rule set and give you the best sequence of work. What's more, with Alice, you can easily quantify the cost and time impact of different decisions. For example, what if I were to add another crane? Or should my concrete crew work overtime? For each solution it creates, Alice generates a fully resource-loaded 4D schedule in seconds. No more building schedules task by task in Excel. Alice does the hard work for you. Once you've selected a schedule, you can export it okay, that's to P6 with enough of that example but um, you can hopefully see how that technology is uh, potentially revolutionizing the way some of the, these complex construction jobs are uh, planned and looking at all the options to cut time cut cost but not cost, cut the quality of the, the job um, look at another example automated video inspection so this of course has been with us for a, a while now the top example um, a lot of people may be familiar with the plane line pattern recognition inspection of track where images of rail fastenings are automatically assessed by uh, algorithms to identify missing or defective components and then uh, that those reports pass through to our track section managers to go and investigate but work continues to enhance the scope of the algorithms to uh, start to automatically detect a larger range of faults and component types. So, uh, for example, on the far right hand side of the, the top of that sequence of photographs is an example of the output from the algorithm now that looks for temporary clamps and clamp joints on the railway and presents um, a much smaller selection of those potential defects to our examination inspectors and section managers to go and investigate. And we're continuing to look at other opportunities to use the same imagery to deliver inspections differently without compromising the system risk. So, for example, taking images of the rail foot corrosion and combining that with rail depth data from our ultrasonic test trains potentially replaces some of the themed manual inspection of rail corrosion in tunnels, uh, which is one of, again, potentially, uh, you know, currently a risky job that requires a lot of safety controls. We could automate that and uh, allow the same individuals who currently go out on track to try and find the defects to actually plan in the work to, to repair them instead. And then across the bottom of this slide, perhaps slightly less familiar technology, but the same, same uh, approach really, taking existing forward facing video and using machine learning to analyze uh, vegetation encroachment and growth combined with LIDAR data and uh, satellite imaging hyperspectral information, looking for those areas where um, vegetation is encroaching the worst or, or growing at a rapid rate and allowing us to plan that activity better. So supporting our busy frontline off track teams, targeting the areas of highest risk uh, in, in terms of vegetation encroachment, striking trains, signal sighting issues. And other innovators are using the same forward facing video to look at uh, other types of risk uh, and support other types of inspection and maintenance. So, for example, uh, just been highlighted to me this morning, there's a 
an Innovate UK first of a kind project working with Northwest and Central Region, looking at using the same one big circle forward facing video to analyse overhead line defects, for example. Um, I've also seen other uh, small medium enterprises using the same forward facing video to start to identify areas of structure gauging risk. So same data set, but applying um, a different type of automation to support our uh, frontline teams making good decisions about when to intervene uh, to, to manage some of these risks. The robotic inspection and repair system was developed as the core of an autonomous robotic vehicle. Before I show this particular video, so uh, now in terms of a uh, autonomous inspection and maintenance vehicle itself, we've through stakeholder consultation, we've determined that we require a bit more of an agile approach to uh, this kind of kit. So we're looking at particular delivery platforms that complement our existing uh, technology, but we can, we can build onto um, different types of capability. So the system architecture that allows us to plug and play a number of options for automated inspection maintenance. Um, we've been looking at the vehicle chassis itself, which I'll come on to in a bit, um, but also the control system for that vehicle. So how does the operator interact with the technology to get the job done? Uh, and this example is the uh, the prototype of a web-based operator interface that allows the control from uh, distance of an autonomous vehicle system. Vehicle system to enable automatic inspection and maintenance activities. The web-based operator interface on the left is used to control the robotic inspection and repair system in the simulated environment on the right. Selecting a job. A job is selected from the current job list. The details of this job are reviewed and the job is confirmed. The distance from the current location to the job location is shown and the vehicle is requested to move there. Obstacle detection. The vehicle begins to move with current position reflected on the operator's map view. Soon, the vehicle detects an obstacle in front of it and slows to a stop. The obstacle is then removed and the vehicle begins to move again. The vehicle detects another obstacle ahead of it, this time outside of the track, but within the predefined loading gauge of the vehicle, and therefore the vehicle slows to a stop. The obstacle is removed, leaving just a single object remaining, which is detected but outside of the loading gauge, and therefore the vehicle begins to move again to the job location. On reaching a predefined distance from the job location, the vehicle begins to slow down, eventually stopping at the job location. Robotic arm operation, inspection and maintenance. On reaching the job location, the operator is able to select from the set of robot arm maneuvers defined for each job. In this case, either an inspection or maintenance maneuver is available. The operator selects an inspection maneuver, which is undertaken by the robotic arm. A maneuver representing a maintenance operation is then selected and on completion, an inspection maneuver is selected again. The job details are reviewed and the job is marked as complete. The list of jobs is updated to reflect this completion. And to build this concept into a, uh, a demonstrator in a representative railway environment, Network Rail has purchased one of these, a Warthog remotely operated vehicle. So the observant among you will notice that's not working on a railway. So what the project have been doing is working on a, uh, a platform to attach this to uh, and developing the first use case for this system. And the first use case is around automated ultrasonic rail inspection. So coupling ultrasonic inspection trolleys, such as the one in the top left there, with the Warthog ROV in the top right. And uh, bottom right, you can see the kind of rail trolley that's being uh, envisaged for this. So the wheels of the Warthog will drive rail wheels and tow the ultrasonic trolley to the right location on the track. The concept is that the autonomous vehicle will receive a start instruction, will inspect the length of track, analyze the inspection data, 
using artificial intelligence to classify the type and severity of rail defects. And in this case, we're working with our partner Sperry, so the, it's their Elmer artificial intelligence system. And then return down the track, same, accurately marking the defects as it runs. When the defects have been marked, the vehicle will return to its start position, um, ready for those to, to feed the information back into our systems so that we can arrange to go and repair those rail defects. And the next steps to achieving the working technology demonstrator are to convert the uh, the Warthog to run a railway track using the design concept at the bottom right. Uh, add the additional UT inspection capability, which is the, the proven technology such as that Sperry system on the top left. Do a bit of can you continue development of the Elmer system so that we can uh, conduct that automated analysis of the uh, ultronic signals as the vehicle runs up and down the track, uh, develop the comms between the, the pieces of the system, and then uh, connect this with posi positional information and mapping systems so that we can ensure that the defects are correctly identified, located, and that information is in interoperable interfaces with our corporate systems. And the future concept is to demonstrate this uh, at a bit of test track at Cranfield University and also to connect up uh, the next piece of automation I'm going to show you, which is a weld repair system. So not only will the system find the defect um, for those of us of uh, the correct shape and size, we can then carry out an in situ repair using another bit of automated technology. And here is that technology. So automated weld repair or discrete defect repair has been developed with uh, a company called ARR Solutions. Uh, and this bit of kit, which I've seen working in the middle last year, it very cleverly manages to map the precise shape of the rail head where there is a rail defect, um, then automatically machines a piece of the rail head away to the correct depth. Uh, using a CNC milling machine, as you can see on the top left there. Um, then the welding process is completely automated, so it applies a preheater, um, conducts uh, CNC controlled flux cord arc welding to build the uh, build the rail back up to profile, um, and then the really clever piece is uh, further operation of CNC milling, machining to reprofile the railhead to match precisely with the, the profile either side of where the, the defect's been repaired. Uh, and so that process is once that um, welding equipment is situated over a defect and receives information on the depth to, to be machined and welded, the rest of the process is fully automated. Uh, and again, that's been demonstrated as a proof of concept and I believe our Wessex route colleagues are really interested in taking this into further trials to see um, how it performs on a bit of operational railway. Uh, some of you may also have seen uh, my next example, which is Spot the Dog, a uh, robotic dog developed by Boston Dynamics. There's some great videos on YouTube if you uh, want to go searching for this, but we've recently been testing it at Tuxford in a railway environment. Um, it's more used to working in uh, sort of manufacturing or uh, environments where there are neater surfaces and uh, nice steps for maneuvering around. So we've been putting it through its paces on ballast over uh, obstacles uh, line side and, and in the forefoot and also investigating how it uh, could potentially crouch out of the way of any oncoming vehicles. So it, potentially it's technology that could remain on on site um in that live environment although a long way to go to demonstrate that's a, a fully uh, approved safety case yet but again really interesting technology and actually uh, swedish railways are looking at this to as a a way of deploying drone technology beyond visual line of sight so the, the system can carry uh small loads on top of the the robot uh, get them to, to sites uh, without someone having to, to walk a drone alongside potentially 
um, also capable of having uh, surveying systems mounted on it and colleagues in the capital delivery world are looking at this as a way of uh, perhaps carrying out some measurement and monitoring of renewal sites so hence we, we tested it at Tuxford but yeah some some good videos online if you want to see a, a bit more about spot the dog and how that operates um, panoptic bridge management so a bit of technology that uses uh, drone uh, video capture and lidar systems to map uh, the state of our structures assets. So the drone technology is, is kind of you know, very standard these days. What the project has been doing very cleverly is to apply machine learning and artificial intelligence to carry out some automatic classification of the kind of defects that the, uh, the LIDAR and the video images capture and doing that in a range of environments. So if it's going to be effective technology, it'll have to work in um, different levels of light, uh, different types of weather, and it'll have to potentially avoid um, a number of obstacles, also um, be capable of accessing perhaps some more difficult spaces. If this is a more universally applied bit of technology. But this is where we're really moving into that um, sort of level four or five space on the NASA scale because the, the technology is carrying out some initial assessment We've removed the need for a, a, a bridge examiner to perhaps get themselves into precarious positions to, to have to try and examine certain parts of the structure. And we're presenting the initial classification back to that competent trained examiner to then um, make the final set of decisions on what intervention is required and to what degree of urgency. Uh, I'll skip past this slide actually. And then my final example is a bit of technology called Prometheus, which again some of you may have heard of. Play the video. The inspection Play of all. mine environments adjacent to the railway is an essential undertaking. However, current methods are time consuming, costly, and pose health and safety risks to workers, such as falls, structural collapse, hazardous gases, fire, and explosions. Prometheus aims to eliminate these risks and provide an efficient solution for capturing high quality mapping data in harsh environments around the world, such as underground mines. The Prometheus project is delivered by a consortium of UK industry and academic experts tasked with delivering a drone that will undertake autonomous exploration and inspection beyond the visual line of sight. To achieve this, Prometheus will combine the latest research in artificial intelligence, drone and sensor technology. The drone will be reconfigurable, designed to be deployed through boreholes 150 millimeters in diameter. This will enable operations in confined spaces. Prometheus has the ability to explore environments beyond the visual line of sight. Equipped with advanced sensors and artificial intelligence, the Prometheus drone can explore unknown environments, mapping its own path and navigating in real time to capture a detailed 3D map of its surroundings. The Prometheus drone will have far-reaching applications in many sectors that demand operations in dangerous and unknown environments. It will be transformative for subterranean infrastructure inspection, especially for mining, rail, construction, utilities and search and rescue, with other potential applications across offshore and nuclear industries. Want to learn more about Prometheus? Contact us at info at Prometheus the inspection of mine environments adjacent to the railway. And the really clever bit about Prometheus is its 360 degree LIDAR um, mapping of its environment uh, and self navigation. So that again is a potentially groundbreaking step change in the way uh, autonomous drones can operate in challenging environments. But I've spent the last few minutes focusing on technology. Um, but I want to finish my presentation by re-emphasizing that for any future automation of our asset inspection and maintenance, it's all about people. We have to work with um, people across our business and industry to introduce these new capabilities in a way that enriches and enhances work and doesn't degrade it. Uh, it's my contention that we should support the move to the sort of MIT level two, three 
automation states, i.e. being employee centred and socially responsible. Um, thanks for listening and I guess it's over to some Q&A now, Rebecca. Thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting presentation. Lots of um, interesting videos there, new technologies that I'm sure quite a lot of us don't know about yet. Um, so I will open up the floor um, for any questions. So you can use your hand or use the text box if you prefer. Okay, well, I'll start with one then, <laughs> whilst we give people a moment. And um, so, out of all the the things you're looking at so far in Network Rail, um, what's what's the one piece that's sort of really exciting you about um implementing within the business? I think the um the panoptic bridge management has got a lot of potential because of the the way we've connected the initial sort of machine learning elements to quite complex data analysis. Uh, involving um, at least three sort of uh, types of data and built the models to to allow that they also connect with our uh, asset management systems that enables to to present the data but in a, in a, a new way but also interface with our sort of conventional ways of, of recording the condition so i think that's uh, and i know our sort of structures colleagues are, are really interested in using this now for a wider range of applications so I think that's that's got some really great opportunities there, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, and now we've got a hand up. So is it Justin? Yes. Hi, I'm a track engineer with Alstom. Uh, our resigling schemes looked at one big circle for access to a lot of data for positioning IBJs, looking at uh, positioning axle counters, yep. recovery of old IBJs, hollow bearers, uh, basically doing sighting forms for our civils assets to go line side, but uh, we just just couldn't justify the license cost. It was just too expensive for us. So we're having to send people out, which was unfortunate. So it's, uh, it's not really a question. It's a, it's an observation. No, that's interesting, Justin, because I guess we we're collecting a lot of that data already. So perhaps the challenge is how we do this sort of you know, measure once used many times, as a, a wise surveyor once told me. Um, yeah, and I, I, I didn't realise that, that that was the kind of business model behind the one big circle offering, Justin. So I mean, it's something I will certainly take away because. Yeah, you need a, an individual licence. It can't be a company licence, can't be shared. So it has to go to an, an individual. OK. But perhaps there's some options there in terms of the way Network Rail is using the data and making it available to um, a wider group of people. Um, if we're investing heavily in the one big circle, Technology. They're, they're certainly involved in the the project to reference around OLE as well. So they're, they're we're providing a lot of support to developing of new capability using their sort of um, their forward facing video inputs. So thanks, Justin. That's that's one thing I will take away and uh, do a bit of investigation on. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question from Rami. Uh, would you like to read that out? I'll read it from the chat. Um, so the question is, is there or are there any figures or statistics for cost driven autom automation for network rail? I think it, Rami, it's we're doing it on a case by case basis at the moment. So the, the kind of projects I've, I've shown, the the um, Prometheus drone, the, the bridge inspections, um, other developments like the um, the Felix robot for inspecting 053 defects in SNC, working up individual business cases. Um, I think the challenge is at what point do we start to look at our wider strategy? So taking the R&D strategy in terms of automation um, and overlaying our business requirements on that. So that we, we're taking a more strategic view of what rate does some of this technology impact our business? And, and let's be realistic and pragmatic about it. Um, but yeah, there are some, there are some um, more detail behind the individual cases uh, and very happy to kind of share some of that afterwards. I'll just have to tap up some of my new R&D colleagues to provide some of the figures. 
Thank you. And we've got um, a couple of questions from Matthew. Would you like to read those out? Yeah, we'll do. Um, yeah, so, so just really one one thing that's uh, always an ongoing question about we as an industry generate a lot of data as it stands now, you know, from lots of different sources, you know, topo surveys, photographs, LIDAR information. And um, I suppose, is there a plan for that kind of stuff now and going forward? Um, I suppose is my kind of first question. Yeah, great question, Matthew. We are working on an initiative called the Survey Data Portal. Um, I think that's slipped behind from its original intentions, but I think you're absolutely right. It's back to that principle of collecting information in a way that um, A, we can locate it confidently on uh, representations of our asset so that others can then pick it up and use it confidently that it's uh, you know it's, it's, it's from the right location and also got the right kind of date stamp on it so there's there's that confidence in the data quality and I think there's yeah. more work to do there to in integrate all these different streams together um, yeah I think you know in the world of track we're more familiar the intelligent infrastructure insight tool is, is making some great strides with some of those data streams but yeah there's, there's great opportunity out there and I think you're absolutely right it, it, it I'm conscious in in kind of talking through some of these examples we need that underpinning data I, I, IT strategy as well so how do we link all this together so yeah it's, it's a way to go perhaps back to Rami's point as well the overall strategy needs defining with a bit more clarity I suppose I'll just jump in with second question as well. So um, is there an opportunity to use, um, so I suppose really machine, I suppose what I was getting at really was machine learning for, you know, utilising TOC and FOC infrastructure, you know, the likes of one big circle and using cameras to to, to capture things. Is, is there an opportunity to use machine learning for, you know, when, say for example, an asset is, you know, has got its graffiti on it or, you know, um, changes in line side vegetation, to, to pick those things up because yeah I suppose that's another another question I suppose Gareth. Yeah I, I think that there definitely is from what I've seen being developed. Um, I think one of the questions we're chewing through at the moment is what capability as network rail do we need perhaps in house so we, we can deploy some more rapid developments because if we've got all that base data nicely organized then it yeah, opens up some really interesting doors to us doesn't it if we've got some capability to design our own little and bits of machine learning, but how much also do we need to to buy in that that capability? But, um, but yeah, absolutely. I think I'll go back to the PLPR example. I think Matthew and, and my you know, sort of recent track days. I think there's massive potential there to look at features that give us a really good in, you know, some different insights into the way that asset behaves. For example, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we have a handout from Catriona. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the individual business cases and wondering what stakeholder management you had to do before that to actually gain some buy-in and if there are any lessons learned from whether it's best that the business area that needs the technology progresses and gets support from either um, you know, tech and data or technology teams or innovation teams and suppliers or like who's best placed to to push and drive and champion a particular area of technology. Thank yeah, you. I think Katrina, that's a, a fantastic question and it sort of applies across the innovation space, not just in the sort of automation field. And um, so we've learned during this control period, control period six with the research and development investment that's been made that the successful projects have a really, uh, a uh, supportive sponsor who has that ability, has the, the resources to then deploy some technology. Uh, and they take the kind of accountability for removing some of the barriers to keep projects moving at pace. And that's a challenge where we've got a lot of ideas all trying to kind of move through the same pipeline. So I think we've. We need those really engaged, accountable sponsors. It's we shouldn't be doing a piece of work unless there's a an obvious uh, and uh, business requirement that our end users and the 
the beneficiaries have signed up to and support all the way through. Um, sometimes quite difficult to to keep going because these projects can take uh, quite a time to develop and people move around our business uh, and it can often some things can lose momentum at times but that's something we, we need to get better at so does that answer your question Katrina um Partly. yes but it's like you know a lot of effort might need to be put into developing a business case yes and so somebody might see the potential for it but that's not their day job whereas the people whose day job it is are really busy and you know you wouldn't get a sponsor until it's quite a developed case and and you know you've got a lot of people involved so it's like which goes first you put a lot of effort into um developing a business case and then trying to find a sponsor that would champion it at a sufficiently senior level or do you just trust the process as in you know identifying risk registers and seeing that something's of a certain level of risk and that you must address it and utilizing existing business as usual processes to um to, to drive improvement and efficiency whether that be cost or safety yeah and i think um that the business as usual process there's, if there's enough of an imperative to make some kind of change then we should be uh, making sure that process encourages and and, and, and creates those ideas and, and resources that the projects to to convert the idea through to uh, a change in the way we work but um, the way we're sort of considering uh, that CP7 research development innovation is um, we may need to provide some additional resources to support that process uh, and also to support the process up front as you've described in terms of the increased analysis and, and effort in the interrogating the business need for a particular idea. OK, so so the, you, you think you've had more success with progressing to trials, those that had a, a, a real clear business need, is that right? Yes. yes. Oh, OK, yeah, thank and you. I'll use the, use the class 153 um, visual inspection unit as an example where uh, two of our regions uh, got firmly behind that project to essentially mount some cameras on a another inspection vehicle to replace an element of our basic visual inspection but because there was that clear imperative to to uh, again remove some of our track workers from hazards on the the track um, it gave it a real momentum and they found the funding and there was a you know, business case that met all the requirements at the regional level so it uh, it turned into a pretty successful project in terms of the, the pace at which some of the development was carried out okay thank you thank you um so i apologize for pronouncing your name wrong um is idra is idra got a question in the chat i i did have a question and it's related to the view, the sort of mid-term view, the long-term view, when, when is this, when are these technologies uh, considered for deployment? Thanks, Isidro. Um, yeah, so the some of the examples I've shown are ready for deployment, first-in-class deployment um, this calendar year. So the, the Panoptic Bridge Management, for example, um, is very advanced in its readiness level. Um, the Prometheus drone is sim similarly. Um, the PLPR systems, again, it's almost um, some of that, you know, algorithm development is, it's not quite business as usual, but it's, um, but the clamping algorithm development has demonstrated um, how quickly some of that uh, enhancement can be delivered and the safety case demonstrated for, for some of those changes. So I think um, in terms of those, automating some of that analysis of data, inspection data, yeah, it's relatively close in terms of some of the um, automating the maintenance process itself, such as the the uh, the Warthog vehicle with the ultrasonic inspection and the rail welding. That's a little further off yet. Yeah. I would say that's um, you know nearer the the second half of the next control period rather than the, the first half. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Edmund. 
Yes, that, thank you. Um, just interested in what you were saying about the train born inspection, uh, and in particular, um, who reviews the outputs of the some of the the defects that you might get. Uh, I can imagine there could be quite a lot of photograph and uh, outputs. Yeah. So is that it, is that reviewed centrally before it gets sent out to the end user, the track maintenance engineer, for example, or is there is there a dump on the track maintenance engineer? Yeah, yeah, no, and, great question, Evan. Yeah, yeah. And I guess has it replaced ultimately has it replaced any manual inspection anywhere? So the the fastening inspection that the mm. PLPR uh, vehicles carry out, the analysis and the reporting is is automated. So the track section manager receives the the list of of missing or defective fastenings. Um, so it's replacing one part of a conventional basic visual inspection but certainly not all of the basic visual inspection mm -hmm. um the clamping system algorithm um was uh, the imperative there was to develop a an algorithm that would filter out spurious uh defects that the sort of version one algorithms were were throwing up for our examination inspectors who do the the first sort of um manual check on yep. the photographs that are shown before those faults are then forwarded to the section manager. So the algorithm filtered out 98% of what were spurious faults to cut down the workload of the examination mm. inspector. And that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. That's Ultimately lead, lead to a, a higher quality inspection yes. at that point, essentially. Mm. Like Otherwise you're creating a, work, a, a massive workload to check stuff that's spurious information. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next one was just a comment from Neil and um, very similar to Justin about using the AVA system within Network Rail and just having to find that justification as sort of the cost benefit of the licenses. So another one just to note. Um, and then we have a final question from Alex. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute there. Um, yeah, no, I obviously I was listening to a podcast this morning that obviously was talking about more movement towards automisation. And obviously, you were looking at largely inspection and maintenance here. Um, but just coming from sort of design angle, whether sort of AI learning um, with regards to sort of simple design schemes like a maintenance tamping scheme, whether there's anybody looking at that or whether that's seen as feasible or whether still the human touch is needed, sort of. Um, more in the design areas. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, so I, I, I'm aware of one example um, that Fugro have been working on with Wells and Western Route, and that's their InnoTamp technology, which is taking the li LiDAR data they've been capturing um, and building some algorithms to uh, develop yeah, tamping schemes from, from that data. Um, there must be others. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'm, Probably need to go and do some homework, um, but it's certainly an area. You'd, having looked at the uh, the Alice technology and the way it's sort of planning and, and supporting the, the construction process, there must be equivalents uh, or certainly an opportunity in the world of design to to apply the same sort of machine learning technology. Um, but I guess there must be uh, there'd be a whole range of considerations there in terms of compliance with uh, all the the right rule sets and, and legal requirements um, and how you optimise that within the, the wider process for, for specification and, and construction. It's an interesting field and yeah, I'd expect to see some more developments in there. Great, great. thank you. Thank you. Um, so to start to wrap things up, I think uh, we'd all like to join together in expressing our gratitude uh, to Gareth for coming along today and presenting to us and to answering our many questions. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and for those of you that are interested, we do have another meeting this evening. Um, it's a hybrid meeting, so it can be in person or via Teams, and that is for a professional registration workshop. Um, so if you are interested in attending in person, it's at Network Rail offices in Baskerville House in Birmingham, if not, the Teams link will be in the invite, which we'll have. Um, and on that, I guess, thank you all for, for coming. And thanks again to Gareth.